Okay, so very recently we've had some new AI models released. We've got ChatGPT 5.1, you've got Google's Gemini 3 Pro, there's been new versions of Grok, new versions of Claude, and so on. Now, traditionally, OpenAI has been the leader of the pack. Maybe in a few areas, let's say like coding, some people might have preferred Claude over OpenAI's offering, but generally it was kind of OpenAI and then everybody else was just trying to catch up and they were they were doing good and they were making improvements and they were kind of in one ear or another, maybe they were catching up, but really OpenAI was the king. However, that's now changed. That really is no longer the case, primarily because of the release of Gemini 3 Pro. So in this video, I want to talk about what's happening at OpenAI. Are they in trouble? Uh, what are other people saying about this? Is Gemini 3 Pro really a threat to it? I then want to do some testing between ChatGPT 5.1 and uh, Gemini 3 Pro just to see what the difference is between them. And then I'm going to give you a hot take on my thoughts about this competition between Google and OpenAI. So if you want to find out more, please let me explain. <laughs> So is OpenAI in trouble? Of course, it's been the leader of large language models and AI for such a long time. Such a long time, of course, very relative, just a few years, but these things have been moving so quickly. Now, following the release of Google's Gemini 3 Pro, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, sent an internal memo to staff warning of tough times ahead. Here are some direct quotes from that memo. Google has been doing excellent work recently in every aspect, and the context there is particularly in pre-training. We know we have some work to do, but we are catching up. So catching up, not that they're staying ahead, they're catching up. We need to stay focused through short-term competitive pressure so Google is putting pressure on. In other words, OpenAI's lead has been eroded and Gemini has caught up and even surpassed ChatGPT in several areas. Now, it was a given previously that Grok and Claude and Gemini were all behind OpenAI and OpenAI was, you know, years ahead of everybody else. That's no longer true. And to make matters worse, the CEO of Salesforce, and Salesforce have been great supporters of OpenAI and ChatGPT financially and, you know, publicity-wise, wrote that he's abandoning ChatGPT in favour of Gemini 3. I've used ChatGPT every day for three years. That's his support for it. Just spent two hours on Gemini 3 and I'm not going back. The leap is insane. Reasoning, speed, images, video, everything is sharper and faster. It feels like the world has changed again. So, so when you get someone who's been a constant user of ChatGPT, someone whose company actually invests in ChatGPT, uses its services, wants to integrate it, says, forget all that, I've just discovered that Gemini 3 is better, that is a really bad sign for OpenAI. So I'm going to do some tests. Now, testing these large language models is difficult. There's just so much stuff they can do and so accurate. So it's trying to find these fringe cases where it can't do it or it makes mistakes. So I've got some tests and let's see what we find out. So the first question, a logic question, just text based. We give it some text. We want an answer. You have two hourglasses, one that measures exactly seven minutes and another that measures exactly 11 minutes. Using only these two hourglasses, can you measure exactly 15 minutes? If so, explain the steps involved. If you want to go away and do some thinking about that, see what answer you come up with. But here's what ChatGPT came up with. Basically, it says you start the seven minute timer and then when it finishes, you start the 11 minute timer and you start your marking point that now starts the 15 minutes. So under ChatGPT's answer, you have to wait seven minutes before you can start timing your 15 minutes. And then when you've turned over the uh, 11 minute timer again at 22 minutes in total, you've then got 15 minutes from when you first marked. That's technically correct. If you add, do all the maths there, it does work. However, it's not the best answer because you have to wait seven minutes to start. So you can't say go, let's time it. You have to say go, but wait seven minutes and then I'll tell you when 15 minutes start. So technically correct, but not the optimum answer. Now, Gemini 3 gives you a different answer where it tells you that you have to flip both of them 
and then when the seven minute uh, hourglass runs out you flip it again and then when the 11 minute hourglass runs out you flip the seven one again which is only halfway through its work but it's got that extra four minutes of sand in there now and so when you flip it halfway through its pouring you get exactly 15 minutes and that is the optimum answer so well done to Gemini. So I think on the scoreboards, we can say that Gemini 3 is leading ChatGPT 1-0 at this point. Okay, now a different type of test. Create an infographic on the topic of Bluetooth codecs. Differences between SBC, AAC, APTX and LDAC. Provides title descriptions and use a simple visual layout with icons. Now, ChatGPT's answer was to describe such an infographic with suggestions for the layout and the icons, but it didn't actually create an infographic, even though that's actually what the question was, create. It did offer at the end of its response to create a HTML version. So I then in a second prompt said okay do that and this is what it gave this is shrunk down because it's actually bigger than uh, a 1080p image but if you were to zoom in it's perfectly good text because it's all html uh, it's a bit busy but it's factually correct and gives you lots of interesting information i like the little stars that it gives here at the bottom telling you what the different strengths are quantity latency uh, and so on and uh, how to pick the right codec so very, very good, lots of good information, but a bit busy, not really an infographic, too busy for an infographic, and it needed two prompts. Now, this is what Gemini gave me in its first attempt, and this is absolutely beautiful. I mean, this really is nice. Technically, it's all correct, uh, and it looks nice. It's not too busy. Uh, each of the four columns there, different colors, different kind of, you know, graphics on them. Absolutely brilliant. So uh, that's a very, very nice uh, infographic. And really, that's what I expect from an infographic. So in that case, I would say that uh, Gemini's attempt was better than ChatGPT's. Now, just out of interest and for sanity's sake, I thought, well, let's try a Grok 4.1, see how well it does. Maybe this is something that's really easy and they all do it really well. Well, actually, no, this is what it gave me. Good attempt. It's got four columns, got the different things in it. But when you zoom in, look at this basic, basic back. OK, and then when you start to look at some of these words, they're just mutilated and they're just messy and you can't look. What does this say? This isn't because of compression or anything. This is what it generated. It's just, it, it doesn't make sense. And it's factually not correct. I mean, what, you know, what's all this? It just doesn't make any sense. So many mistakes and text that doesn't make sense or is unreadable. So clearly the fact that ChatGPT was able to do such a good one and Gemini was able to do a better one is actually very impressive. So I think we can say that it's now 2-0 to Gemini 3. Here's another question. What are the values of the top face of these dice? So this is a different type of question now. We're giving it an image and asking it to analyze it. So we've given it some text with some logic. We've uh, asked it to generate an image. Now we're giving it an image and asking it to tell us something about it. And, you know, we as humans would find this very easy. 4, 4, 1, 1 and 5. I mean, that's very easy for us to tell. Of course, we would ignore the 4 and the 1 here, the 2 here. We'd ignore all those because for us it's very easy just to tell what the top. It's not so easy for these large language models. So this is what ChatGPT gave me now. It says 1, 1, 4, 4 and 6. So it's got the fact that there are two ones, it's got the fact that there are two fours, and it's got this as a six rather than as a five. Now, it didn't really tell me what order it was expecting. I mean, it gave me the middle ones and then the ones to the left and then the one to the right. So that's not so good, but it got four out of five correct. So that's a good attempt. That's the best attempt I've seen with this image. And just to mention, it was Craig Steppy that sent me this image a little while back while I was doing other videos on LLM. So thanks to him for providing this image. Now here's Gemini's answer. So it says, top die one near the pen, so that's correct. Far right die five, that's correct. Far left die six, no, that's a four. Uh, bottom left die is a four correct and bottom center is a one. So again, it got four out of the five correct. It actually told me which ones it was referring to. So I think its answer is better than chat GPT. Uh, so definitely a plus for Gemini, but it's, it's still wrong. It didn't get it all right. So we'll say both of them uh, got it wrong there. So here's a hot take for you. Why OpenAI will fail and Google will win? Everything we're talking about today, large language models, image creation, and just so on, basically OpenAI created it all. We didn't have this before, and then ChatGPT hit the market and everyone went, wow, and then it's been getting better and better and better and better. Now, in an economic, in, from a business point of view, being the first is often a disadvantage because your competition 
is kind of coming up behind you and they don't have the same pressures on them as you do. For example, if you're the pioneer, you need to invent the technology first of all, so you're leading the way. It means you've got huge R&D investments. But not only that, you may have to raise the money because it's a new company, a new startup. You've got to go for funding. And so you've got all of these problems because you're at the front. And the others who are coming up behind you don't have the same problems. They have their own problems, but they're not the same. They're not trying to forge their way through the forest. They're kind of coming up behind you. And that means often in history and business, the people, the competition that are coming up behind you eventually overtake and the pioneer drops out and may even go bankrupt, gets bought out or whatever. Now, OpenAI have been leading the way, no doubt about it. They have been doing uh, just amazing things, but other companies, you know, Google and Claude and Grok and so XAI have been coming up behind them, trying to replicate their success, trying to uh, do the same thing with the technology, trying to do better. And it's always been hard. And up until now, OpenAI have been winning. But now with Gemini 3 Pro, that's really, is they've caught up. That's, they're now in this problem. Now, why do I think that Google will eventually win? and OpenAI will drop to the side? Well, there are a number of reasons. The first one, of course, is Google's reach. I mean, YouTube, Gmail, Android, Google Search, Google Chrome, Chrome OS. You know, we could just go on and on and on and on, listing all the things that Google are already into that are part of our digital lives that we rely on as part of our digital lives and they can integrate that across the whole uh, spectrum of their services and bring their AI offerings to the whole thing. OpenAI don't have that. I don't use OpenAI for my Gmail. I don't watch videos on OpenAI. I don't have a phone that runs an OpenAI operating system. You know, I don't use a web browser that comes from OpenAI and so on and so on. Now they're trying to do that, as I've got a video here on the OpenAI web browser because they're trying to expand their reach so they can have this integration across the whole different aspects of our digital lives. But Google already have that. And other people have it. Microsoft have it slightly as well. You know, uh, and Apple has it with their offerings and so on. But Google is really the leader. And basically, most of the services that I personally use and a lot of people use are just Google based services. Now, another big thing is that Google has lots of money. I mean, it's a very profitable company. It makes a lot of its profit from its advertising business across all of these services. And we're talking billions of dollars, billions and billions of dollars. And it's got that money. And even if it needs to throw a lot of money into research, even if it needs to throw a lot of money into providing services. Uh, for free or a lower cost, it can do that because it has the cash to do it. When you're the pioneer, you're looking for venture capitalist funding and you're looking for other type of funding. Uh, you, you can't do that. Google can do that just because of its size. So that's another reason why it came. It started out behind. It wasn't doing as well. It's plowed money and of course talent and technology. Yes, yes, yes. But it's been able to get those resources together and come now and overtake uh, OpenAI. And related to that, it can offer things, uh, free services. Now, of course, Google has got a big weakness in the sense that it's offered so many free services in the past and then they die and they go to the Google graveyard and we lament that oh, I really relied on that and now they've gone ahead and killed it off. So that is a negative aspect, but they can offer services for free. Uh, you know, Gmail is free. YouTube is free. Now, they're all supported by advertising in one way or another, but these are the things they don't need to ask you to pay for it. Now, what's been interesting is, is that Google are, have been asking people to pay for AI from the very beginning. They have got these AI tiers in their program, but they also offer a lot of the AI stuff for free and you can just use it and it just works and you don't have to pay. Now, I do pay for OpenAI at the moment. I pay the the, for the plus subscription, is it $20? I forget now, uh, every month. And that's been very useful for me. But at some point, it's going to be like, well, if I'm already into Gmail and to YouTube and to Google Drive and to Google Docs and I've bought the storage and I've bought this, and I, well, I might as well just use the AI from there. So that's, you know, the temptation that, again, as I talk about integration, I'm already there in integration. So I can just, you know, 
just allow it to be integrated into my digital life. Now, talking of the integrations, there will be some bad integrations from Google because we're still trying to work out how this stuff all fits in. Do I really want every time I start typing something, a little pop up to come and say, I can write this email for you, you know, a little Microsoft clippy icon to say, no, no, there's going to be some mistakes and they're going to make some offerings that they don't get right. I mean, when they tried to do social media, Google did they have three, four attempts to try to do social media uh, and they never really uh, got it right. And so, you know, they are going to make some mistakes, but where it hits home, like Notebook LLM has been very, very powerful and very well received and uh, a lot of people use it. And it was kind of more of an experiment. And then it's like, oh, hey, well, this is really useful. So there are going to be these kind of services that they integrate. Some are going to succeed and some are going to fail. But the point is it can do it because of its reach and because of its money and because it can offer things for free. So what does this mean over the long term? Well, I think over the long term, I think OpenAI are going to struggle. And when I say long term, we haven't even had large language models over a long term. I mean, we're only talking a couple of years, you know, three years or something. We're not talking like 10 years, 20 years. But I think over the long term, I think OpenAI are going to struggle because although the technology they invent may be amazing and the models may even be amazing, because they don't have that reach to integrate it into Android and Chrome OS and into Google Home, Google Assistant and, you know, Maps and <laughs> YouTube and, and, you know, everywhere and do it well. I'm not saying Google aren't going to make mistakes. I said that earlier. They, they may integrate things that will annoy us, but ultimately they can. They can reach. Whereas OpenAI can just say, I've got this one thing. We all offer this model to do this thing. And the advantage they had at the moment was the model was good and no one else had a model just as good. But now they've lost that advantage, then what is their unique proposition? What is their un what makes them special? And they don't have that anymore. So I think over the long term, and I mean the next few years, we may find OpenAI actually uh, falters quite significantly, and others like Google and Claude and Grok and Microsoft and Oracle and all these other Apple even we don't know they could all just suddenly res you know come forward with their own uh, ways of doing things and the pioneer gets left behind. Love to hear your thoughts on that. What do you think? You think I'm mad? You think I'm crazy? Gary, how could you say that? Or do you think there's there's actually an element of truth in, in what I'm saying? Love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, please do give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one.